Hey, good morning, New Community Church. So good to see everybody here today. Why don't you touch somebody? Don't touch somebody. Just say, hey, good to be sitting beside you today. Tell them that. Good to be sitting beside you. Um, wow, what a, what a crazy couple weeks we've been in. I know everybody's freaked out. Uh, people are buying toilet paper stock, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to make some investments. You know, just crazy stuff going on. But y'all, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've got some good news. I've got some, y'all, hey, y'all ready for some good news? All right, so I've got some good news today, and we're going to dive into the Word of God, and God's Word is always good, and it's always good news, and we're in the series Eyes on Him. Of course, uh, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. There's so many things to look at, so many things to be anxious over, worried about. Obviously, the world right now uh, is at a standstill, wondering what's next, but I'm thankful we have the Word of God. And I'm thankful we can gather today. Other churches are not gathering, but we have the privilege of gathering. Uh, and, you know, we want to be safe. We want to do things right. But as we gather and as we study God's Word, I know that God has some great things in store for us. And He wants to uh, calm our fears. He wants to give us encouragement. God, I believe God's Word is going to be food for our soul today. And so in this series, Eyes on Him Today, we're focused uh, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus said in this prayer, he said for us to pray, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And as you think of the word debt, usually you don't, you know, you're not thinking of something uh, spiritual. Uh, we obviously, when we think of debt, we think of our debt and we're thinking of real money. But what is money? You ever thought about what is money? Well, it's a dollar bill, or it's a hundred dollar bill, or you know, you open up your wallet and you think, okay, well, th this is money. Okay, so I can I can get gas, I can get food. It it's money. There are digits somewhere in the cloud, and and we're hoping those digits are good. And uh, I heard one comedian say that this week that the stock market went down. I think. 2,000 points, and then went back up. He said, where is this money going? It's just, and I, and I agree. It's like uh, back in the day, you know, you would trade badger skins, and so you, you give a badger skin, and then someone gives you some beads, and, and somehow the faith is in, not in the token itself, but what the perceived value would be in, in the ability to make that exchange. So when you, money, you know, the, we have no gold standard to go by. You know, our dollar bills are not backed by a bunch of gold in Fort Knox. Uh, so what is money? Money is simply faith. Faith. We put faith in our economic system. You know, so when there's fear, then the stock goes down. And when there's faith, it goes up. But nothing's really changed. It's just, it all has everything to do with fear or faith and how fear and faith can affect what we call money. Uh, the, the, now, the problem with money, the, the problem with man's system of money is this uh, credit debt conundrum. The credit debt conundrum is, you know, you, in order to make money, you have to spend money. And, and so the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And it's like the wheels of a bicycle. Both have to be turning in order for the bicycle to stand up or it's going to fall. And the same with the economy. There has to be this credit debt flow in order for our economy to, to stay where it is. But the, the problem is that the debt of the world is not going to be any less. As a matter of fact, it's growing. It's growing exponentially. I was on a website uh, on global debt, and you can see the, the chart. And I, I recorded uh, this. My, my I did a screenshot recording of my laptop. And check this out on the screen. This was a couple days ago. The world, uh, the current global public debt is 58 trillion. I think right now it's, it's close to 60 trillion. And that's just the public debt. That's not the corporate debt. And you can, you can search the internet and find tons of these and, and they fluctuate. They're, they're, there's no one that really has the complete total answer. But when you think of say $50 trillion, that's a lot of money. We can't even think in terms like that. When, like, let me give you an example. Think of a million seconds. A million seconds it's 12, 12 days from now. So that's a million seconds. Okay. So jump from million to billion. We think we know what a billion is. Well, a billion seconds is 32 years. Wow, that's a huge jump from 12 days to 32 years. How about a trillion seconds? 
A trillion seconds is not 32 years. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. So our global debt, if you were to take the public debt and the, the corporate debt all and ball it up, it's 100, 100 trillion plus. And, and, and it seems like Dave Ramsey's not going to get us out of this mess, and there's no real money system that's going to help us if we try to balance the budget, balance the books. It's just getting worse because it's under a curse. It's, a, it's flawed. It's not going to get better. You say, well, thanks for encouraging us today. That's a little bit discouraging. When you think of debt, I want you to think of your personal debt, your college loans, your car loan. You guys getting depressed yet? Your, uh, your, house, your house note, your mortgage, your credit card. You, you just take all that. Now, how much does that amount to? Now, look at the world. Here, here's the cool thing. God helped the ancient Hebrews understand a way and how to reset their economy. Did you know this? It's in the Bible. Every seven years, according to, and you won't see it on the screen, but according to Deuteronomy 15, every seven years, they would reset and everybody's debts would be forgiven. So, so here's the, I'm trying, I'm going to give you the spoiler, or the, the, the secret to fixing the money problem in the world is something called forgiveness. Now, literally, the Jewish people would forgive their debt, all debt, anyone that owed them anything. They would, all the slaves would, would get set free every seven years, and it was one big hallelujah, high five, people belly bumping, break dancing in the streets. It's crazy. But not only that, every 50 years, there was something called a jubilee. So they had the Sabbath year every seven years, and then they had the year of jubilee, and that is everybody gets the original land back, their family land. It, it was property and ownership, and, and God, God said, the land is mine, but I'm establishing this in you because it's, it's going to be a reset of the economy, and it, it's an illustration because it happened on the Day of Atonement, the, the year of Jubilee, which was an illustration of Christ and how he came to forgive our debt, how he came to wipe the record clean. If you were to have all of your debt cleared today, what would be your emotional response? Come on, somebody, you'd be fired up. Now, I want you to think of your sin debt. The numbers you saw on the screen a while ago, that's the, 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 the money debt, but the sin debt is even greater. I mean, if you don't pay your bills, uh, you, know, you, 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 know, you may get your car repossessed or they may foreclose on your mortgage and you may go to jail if you don't pay your bills, if you don't pay that debt. But your sin debt is not just going to jail, your sin debt will send you to hell. The sin debt is going to, you know, there's death, there, there's, you know, living with the devil forever. So it's huge when you think of how Christ came to forgive us and to wipe our, our debt of sin off of our record. I had, you know, I had a dream while I was studying for this uh, sermon the other night I had this dream and I dreamed that uh, Brian Lanham, is Brian Lanham in the building? Where, where are you, Brian? Okay, there everybody, he's hiding. Okay, so Brian Lanham and I, we were in heaven. Okay, so we, this was in this dream, so I, I walked in, we were excited, we got to go to heaven, and God was showing us around, and, and uh, he's, I saw these clocks on the wall, and these clocks, uh, they were, I said, what, God, what are those? And he said, these are sin-o-meters. They, every time someone sinned in their life, it, it, it records the sin, and I, I went over and saw mine, it said Simeon Young, and it was a, and I said, man, that thing is is, is moving. He said, yeah, the Lord said, this was the, your, every time you sinned, the, the, the arm would move. And Brian started, he said, man, that thing is moving pretty fast. You must have been doing a lot of sinning. And so, and Brian said, he said, where's mine, Lord? Where's my sin meter And the Lord says, uh, Brian, yours is down in the basement. It gets hot down there. We use yours for a fan. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I'm just joking. Right. It was not a real dream. Anyway, I, I got Robert uh, Jackson last, last service. I tried to get him to stay for this service, but he wouldn't because I was going to tease him again. But anyway, uh, here, here's, here's y'all, the blood of Jesus is real money. Our, 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 our money, our dollar bills, our digits, whether you've got Bitcoin or whatever, whatever uh, method or token of trustworthiness you use, it's based on faith, right? Right? It's based on faith or fear. When, when we were afraid, the value goes down. When we have faith, it goes up. The same is with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is real money. 
It's, it's, it's eternal money. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, 7. Check this out, y'all. I, I'm excited about God's word today. It says, in him, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Look at those three words. You see forgiveness. You see redemption. You see riches. The Bible is money talk. It's all about money. It's all about ownership. You know, because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, they, they were ruling the earth, but because of their sin, they turned the title deed of themselves and everything over to Satan. Now, Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan is the prince of this world. He's the power behind the scenes. You remember the time that Jesus was in the wilderness fasting and the devil came to him and he said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the money in the world. He, he said, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. The devil said, because it's been handed over to me. And I can give it to whomever I wish. Jesus did not argue that point. Why? Because Satan does control the world. He is the prince of this world. So Jesus, the son of God, came to shed his blood, his precious blood, to make a payment. It's G the blood of Jesus is money, and the blood of Jesus pr pr provides for us redemption, forgiveness, and enrichment. Forgiveness, redemption, and enrichment. Our lives are made better because of the blood of Jesus. So here's the big takeaway. Faith in the blood of Jesus is the eternal money that forgives you, that redeems you, and that enriches you. Your faith in the blood of Jesus. You say, I don't know that I believe that. Well, you have the right to be wrong. It, the scripture says that, that this is true. The, the, the entire word of God is built on this. If this is not true, what are we doing here? If this is not true, why are we coming to church and why are we singing these songs? If we have hope in this life only, we're more miserable than, pe than the people out there. So we might as well just hang this up and let's go out and, and, and live high on the hog and just forget this whole thing about Jesus if it's not true. But it is, it tr it is true. It's almost too, too good to be true when you think of the fact that the blood of Jesus is money. Look what it says in, in Luke 12. Check this out. Verse 16. He told them a parable. Jesus is talking. He said, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Okay, they didn't have banks like we have now. So he's, he's talking about how am I going to save this? And he said, I'm going to do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. In other words, he's ready for retirement. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And, and, and see, this is all good, but look what the Lord says. He says, he, he calls him a fool. He said, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? In other words, where, where all is this stuff, stuff going? And he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself Check it out. Treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And then in verse 33, skipping down, Jesus, look what he says. He says, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. In other words, eternal money bags with, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is saying, you, want, you need to be rich towards God. You need to value what God values. You need to have something worthy of putting your faith in. Because putting your faith in the world's economy is not going to get you where you need to go. It's so temporal. It's so flawed. It's so messed up. It's not going to get any better. But if you get a real money bag, a money bag that is eternal or something that you can put your faith in that's going to last or stand the test of time, that's where you need to be. So that's why we say faith in the blood of Jesus is real money. It's eternal. It's powerful. The blood of Jesus is greater than your anxiety. Come on, somebody. The blood of Jesus is greater than all of your worries, all of your fears. It's greater than, 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 than any virus. It's greater than, because the blood of Jesus Christ not only pays a debt of sin, but there's healing power in the blood of Jesus. There's eternal weight and glory in the blood of Jesus. It's what God values more than anything else. So here's my 
First point, I've got three big takeaway points. The first point, I know somebody's going to shout hallelujah, and that is you owe nothing. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you owe nothing. I'm saying absolutely nothing. You, 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 you say, I feel like I owe something. No, you owe nothing. You're, the blood of Jesus Christ paid not just your past debt of sin, your present sins, and your future sins. It is so powerful. It, he does this for the sins of the whole world. It's already been done once and for all. The key is to tap into it through faith. This is God's economy. Look what it says in Hebrews 10.10. Y'all tracking with this? Hebrews 10.10. Man, I need my amen corner to wake up. Come on now. All right. It says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service. This is the Jewish system, right? This is the religious system. Offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Those sacrifices in the Old Testament, you know, see the wages of sin is death. Because of the debt of sin, all sin is debt. Let me just pause right there. The, the, the sacri- there had to be a death. There had to be blood spilled. And so that pays for that sin. But in the Old Testament, it just pushed the debt forward. And so here he's saying the p- priests are offering these sacrifices that never take away sins. But when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Wow. Look at verse 17. This is what God says. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. In other words, you owe nothing anymore, right? For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So the sacrifice has been made. The blood has been shed 2,000 years ago, once for all. It's for the whole sins of the world, for everybody whose sins were pushed up to that point. And then after that time, the key is faith. Faith in the blood of Jesus. Now the problem with religion, and we can all be religious, When I say religion is the dirty word we don't want to be a part of, religion is this man's system of checking boxes in order to pay God back, right? So we're going to pay God back and pay our way to heaven because we're good little boys and girls. And what that does, it just perpetuate the sense of false, uh, it's a false understanding of the way God's economy works. As humans, we still sin. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to come short. And sadly, we we feel guilty and we continue to struggle and think, if I can only do better, then then God's going to accept me. If I only do better, God's not going to uh, kill me. Uh, There was one guy in our church years ago when I was a kid. This guy stood up and we had testimony time. You know, you guys remember testimony? Man, it's open mic. Anybody can get up and say what they want. This guy stood up and says, I want to praise God that he hadn't killed me yet. As a kid, I think, what kind of theology is that? Even as a kid, I knew that was ratchet. That's stupid. And, and that's, a lot of people think that God's just getting ready to, if they don't do right, then he's going to slam the hammer down on their head. No. Jesus Christ took our punishment. He, he took our bad, and now we get the credit for all the good stuff that Jesus did. So I'm going to say it again. You owe nothing. You owe nothing. My, my wife said in the first service, she said, you were really preaching strong, and you, you, you had that serious look, and it looked like you were mad. Like, do I look like I'm mad, y'all? But I'm passionate, you know, about this, because this is what we build our lives on. So here's the thing. Your sin debt is not too big for God to forgive. Keep that in mind. It's not too big. You say, well, I've done so much. It's not too big. The scripture says where grace abounds, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. The, the more sinning there is, the more grace God is going to, to, to flow to, to mankind. So, and it's all through faith in Jesus Christ. Here's my second, my second point. And this is going to be tough. You, I know you guys celebrate over the first one. You owe nothing. But hang in with me. You may not agree with me at first. But I'm going to say it anyway. You own nothing. You, because of your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, you own nothing. Nothing. Well, how is this? Well, because he redeemed you, and now you are God's possession. You're, you're, you are God's possession. You own nothing. This is good news, believe it or not, because, because, because before Christ, you, you still didn't 
own anything. Satan owned you. You were his possession. You, you, you did his bidding. You, you, you lived according to, to his law. And you were children, you were by nature a children of wrath. You, you were a child of Satan. But because of Jesus Christ and that payment for your sin, now you have been purchased by, by God. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul is talking to the Corinthian church because they had, I think, forgotten what this was all about. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Look what it says here. You are not your own. I want to say that again. You are not your own. Why? For you, have been, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, here's the thing. We love the fact that, man, our sins are or wipe clean, our, he's forgiven our debt of sin, but I still own myself. It's just me, and I'm going to do my thing, you know, and, and I'm going to come to church and do God a favor, you know, to worship him and serve him. No, I'm not my own. This, I'm Simeon Young, but I am not my own, because I've been bought with a price. I am owned by God. I'm operated by God. If I were to say a few words, and if I, if I say the word body, you say, uh, it's not mine. Let's practice. I'm going to say, your body. All right, that's kind of tough to say that, right? You just track all through your life. If I say your car, you're going to say? It's not mine. Your house. Your kid. Oh, you almost didn't want to say that, right? <laughs> I didn't mean to be awkward there, but, but none of what we have is ours. You don't think of ownership, think of stewardship. Our lives are on loan from God. And, and we are stewards of what God has given us. We are stu- we have been, because of our faith in Jesus and, and our debt of sin has been forgiven, we owe nothing, but neither do we own anything. And there's a freedom in that, knowing that our lives are his, our house is his, our kids are his. The Bible says that the, your children are in heritage of the Lord. I, I told my kids this a long time ago, and I've told you this, that what I tell, told my kids, that I'm not your real dad. I'm your earthly dad, but I'm not your real dad. Your real father is in heaven, and because of your faith in Jesus, now he owns you. And it's important for us to get this, because if we don't get this, we're going to be glory thieves. If we don't get this, we're going to steal the credit. Satan is the ultimate thief. He was in heaven with all the other angels, and he wanted the glory. He wanted more. He, he wanted almost like God's place, and so he was kicked out of heaven, and so he came and tempted Adam and Eve to do the same, to take on his nature, and that is to want to be their own God. If you'll eat of this fruit, you'll be, you'll be your own God. And we've been eating from that tree ever since. And so the key is for us to embrace the gospel and know that, that we've been redeemed. We've been bought with a price. In 1 Peter 1, it says you were, you've got to know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things or, or silver and gold or man's system of money. You've not been redeemed like that, but you've been redeemed with the precious or the valuable blood of Jesus Christ. This is, this is good news. The gospel is not just about Jesus being our Savior. The gospel is about Him being Lord. That we're owned and operated by Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Jeremy shared this scripture with me this week. As I was sharing with him uh, what I felt like God had laid on my heart. And he reminded me of 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, what do you have that God hasn't given you? Oh, wow. And, and if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift. It's, we, 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 we want people to think that it's us, that it's ours, that, and we want to feel good about ourselves, and everyone to think we're awesome, and, and that we're rich, and that we're going places, and, and, and we're movers and shakers, and we want to steal the credit or take the credit that's due to God. And so I think when we understand that we're not our own, that we've been bought with a price, it helps us live every day for His glory. It helps us live every day to, to, to not take from God or rob from God. You, know, you say, how can we rob from God? Well, in Malachi, it talks about robbing from God. It's in the Old Testament. It's, and he said, how do we rob you? Well, in tithes and offerings, you, you've, you've, not, you, you've not honored me. And so a lot of people would stop there and say, see, you know, God owns 10%. I say he owns more than 10%. I say he owns 100%. And our lives are a stewardship. And so we give and we, we serve out of that overflow of knowing that our lives are on loan from God. And we're going to live every day for his glory and to proclaim his name 
because we're not our own. We're not our own. So I'm going to wrap up. Check this out, y'all. Here's, my, here's my, my third and final big point, and it's another tough one. And, and you, it, It's a tough pill to swallow, but I'm going to say it anyway. No one owes you anything. No one owes you, because you're rich now. You're, you're not, you haven't just been forgiven of debt. You haven't just been purchased by God, and now you're God's property. Now you are rich. You are rich in, you know, God is a rich God. He, the Bible says he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, but he owns the world. He owns everything. He owns it all. Satan has been given temporary permission to, to rule for a while, but someday he's coming back and, and Jesus will be king of kings and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and we're going to rule and reign and we're going to inherit the earth. So when you think of the rich God we serve, the God that wants us to be rich towards him, understanding how the blood of Jesus gives us this access, this, this, this thing called being enriched or made rich is, is so awesome. The scripture says that God is rich in love. Scripture says that he's rich in mercy. And it also says that he's rich in forgiveness. So that, that sets it up to where you know that no one owes you anything because you're so rich. Why, why would you need anyone to owe you anything? If you were Warren Buffett, a billionaire, and someone owed you 50 bucks, you wouldn't chase him down and choke him or get him in a headlock or wrestle him to the ground. No, you just you let it go because that's nothing. That's chump change. When you know how wealthy you are. I think so many Christians are lit, they have a poverty mindset a scarcity mindset. And so they have a hard time letting go of offenses. You know, offense can be the, the bait of Satan. If you're offended, if someone has offended you, the Bible says, blessed are those who love your law for nothing shall offend them. When you know how rich you are, when you know God's word, nothing, you don't, you don't have an offense. No one can offend you because you're rich. You just forgive. So you pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You can't have one without the other. As you know how much you've been forgiven, it equips you with gospel forgiveness. It equips you to treat others the way God has treated you. Now you are rich in love. Come on, somebody. You are rich in mercy. You are rich in forgiveness. You have so much at your disposal. Jesus told a parable of this wealthy guy that had some servants or some employees and one guy owed him one translation says 22 years worth of wages it's millions of dollars and his employee owed him that and so he he said I want to put you and your family in prison until you pay it back and the man said please 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 forgive me please forgive me please forgive me please 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 and the, and the master he had mercy and compassion. He said, I, I'm going to forgive you of that debt. You're forgiven. Well, that same employee went out and found a fellow employee that owed him $2,000. Well, this, this is in, it's in Matthew 18. You can read it later, Matthew 18, 21. He found this guy that owed him a lot less, and he choked him and, and said, pay me what you owe me, pay me, and, and, and the guy paid him back, and the master found out what happened. And Jesus is telling this story. The master said, don't you remember the millions of dollars that I forgave you of? You remember that? And you went out and wouldn't forgive your friend? So that debt that you were forgiven of, he said, now you're going to have to be put in prison or given over to the tormentors until you pay that back. Which is never, right? He can never pay it back. And then Jesus added, to those listening, so will your heavenly Father do also unto you if you don't forgive from your heart those who owe you a debt. Forgive from the heart. And as I've been preparing for this sermon, I, God, you're talking to me. You're talking to us. What is it that's in our hearts that we haven't let go of yet? That little infraction, that that time someone didn't return a phone call or someone said something derogatory about you behind your back or whatever it is, can you let it go? Do you know how rich you are? Do you know 
how much you've been forgiven. I want you to know how much you've been forgiven so that you can walk away saying, man, I am, I'm a billionaire in God. I am rich. And, and, you know, we can't do this without the Holy Spirit because when Jesus breathed on his disciples after his resurrection and he said, receive you the Holy Spirit, he said, to whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. To whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we have the nature of God where we can have this type of riches. And I pray this is true for everyone in the room. If you're living with a scarcity mindset and you've been holding on to a lot of stuff, you're going to live a miserable life. But once you step into this abundance, you're going to be able to just say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. His disciple says, well, Lord, how many times should we get, forgive a person in one day? Seven times? Man, that'd be really good, you know. I forgave that person seven times. Jesus said, no. I say 70 times seven. That's 490 times. I almost wanted to get a little, just imagine a Kleenex box. Oh, you can't find them in around here. You know? I forgive you, 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 I forgive you. Just, it just never stops. It seems like it never stops. That's the kind of forgiveness we need to have. Amen? Y'all good with this? Y'all ready to go out and forgive somebody and love somebody? Come on, let's make the world a better place with the gospel. Yes, we can do this. Come on, stand, stand. Y'all, we can't shake hands or high five, but you know what? We can, we can high five the Lord or we can high five ourselves. And let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on now. Thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace.